Good morning. Really cool to have you all here. Uh, <clears throat> this week in lab, Wednesday or Friday, I wrote it Friday up here, uh, several things do. The molar mass lab from last week is due. The rough draft of your class presentation paper is due, which again, about two type pages, the cover sheet, at least one of the peer-reviewed articles. That would be awesome. We'll talk about problem set number four, which has gas laws and some intermolecular forces, but the quiz itself only has gas laws, all right? So just let me know that. And then finally, afterwards, we'll start the linear regression crystal structure of solids lab. It has a different name. I, that was what I remembered in this morning phase. But anyway, we'll start that stuff. It's partially paper and partially an in-class lab. We'll check that out. Any questions before I start? All right, so on Monday, we started talking about the intermolecular forces and how intermolecular forces are what people use to describe how liquids go to solids and how solids go to gas and stuff like that. They're kind of like little tiny hands that hold on to the other molecules. It's really important that you realize that if you take like water, liquid water, and you boil it, or you take liquid water and you freeze it, it's still H2O. It's still tetrahedral sp3 uh, bent molecular geometry 109-ish angles. Uh, what's changing is the relationship between the water molecules. And in a solid, you have, as we'll see here in a little bit, you have really, really strong intermolecular forces holding on. We'll talk about liquids now, and of course gases have no intermolecular forces working on them at all. <clears throat> so let's talk now about liquids, because now that we've kind of discussed what intermolecular forces are all about, we can better understand the liquid dynamic. Now, gases we saw a lot of in the last chapter, they're all over the place, PV equals NRT, blah, blah, blah. In a liquid, you have molecules which are in constant motion, they're constantly moving around. Liquids do have pretty strong intermolecular forces, so we'll be talking about dipole-dipole, hydrogen bonded, stuff like that. Liquids are almost incompressible. Now, a gas, you can compress and expand to the end of the earth if you want to. But liquids, it's very, very difficult to do that. And uh, we'll talk about that more later. And finally, as you know, liquids don't completely fill the container. So let's imagine this is a closed container. If you put some gas in, then the gas distributes evenly pretty much throughout the container. But liquids are affected by gravity. So the liquids will go down to the bottom in this case. They'll kind of hang out down here. You won't have gases on top. According to the kinetic molecular theory, the molecules of a solid are locked in place, though they have motion. Molecules of a liquid are closely associated with each other, but move relative to one another. Molecules of a gas move independently and occupy a much larger volume than those of a corresponding liquid or solid. The kinetic molecular theory, the KMT, is what chemists use to describe the differences between the phases. And you can see now here in gases, like the molecules are just all over the place. They're not interacting with each other. There's no intermolecular forces. Liquids, though, do have strong intermolecular forces, and that's why they kind of hold on to each other. Now, they'll flow, all right? They will uh, kind of take over whatever area they've got, but uh, they don't, like, separate like gases do. And we're going to see in a while that solids have super strong intermolecular forces. <clears throat> It's really important as a scientist to know how things evaporate and how they condense. So if you're making tea this morning or coffee because you need a little kick in the arm on a cold day, uh, yeah, you'll have to heat your water up and some of the water will turn into a gas or a vapor. On the other hand, you let the vapor sit around long enough, it will condense back to the liquid phase. So let's think about evaporation and condensation with our chemistry hat on, all right? If you go from a liquid with strong intermolecular forces to a gas, which for our purposes has no intermolecular forces, you're gonna have to add energy because you're gonna have to break up those little individual water molecules in the liquid and make them independent. So going from a liquid to a gas is always endothermic you always have to add energy. I know of no examples where going from a liquid to a gas is exothermic. It's always endothermic because you're breaking those intermolecular forces. 
On the other hand, the gases, as you cool them down, they then begin to form intermolecular forces again. And forming intermolecular forces actually takes some of that energy and disperses them. So you actually have energy released upon going from a gas to a liquid. And so in all cases, as far as I know, going from a gas to a liquid is exothermic. Energy will come out. So endothermic liquids to vapors, all right? And it doesn't matter if it's gasoline, water, or, uh, or Jack Daniels, <laughs> just so you know. But anyway, all of those to go from a liquid to a gas would take energy, endothermic. On the other hand, taking gases and condensing them back to a liquid, exothermic. Now, if you've ever gotten, taken a thing of water to make pasta, say, and you heat it up, you begin to see boils, you begin to see bubbles when it boils, but the liquid doesn't automatically all turn into a gas, <laughs> all right? It's a slow process. So when you have a liquid that you want to make into a gas, what happens is the outer atoms or molecules, whatever you're looking at, the outer molecules, some of them begin to have enough energy to break free of their liquid matrix. Now in the liquid, they've all got intermolecular forces holding on to each other. But some of the molecules will always have enough energy to break free, all right? And that's gonna be important to us here in a little bit. <clears throat> so if you have like a liquid in a beaker, and you just leave it out for long enough, all right? Random thermal motions and the heat coming in from different sources, the liquid will eventually just go away, it begins to evaporate, because the outside atoms in an open container will just go off into the ether and stuff like that and not come back. It takes energy, all right? It's an endothermic process. But because molecules have a range of motions, you'll always have some on that surface that are able to make it. Now, we're gonna talk here in a little bit about these little molecules that exist over the liquid, and they exist as a vapor, as a gas, and that'll be important to us here coming up. Molecules of a liquid have a range of kinetic energies. Some have enough energy to overcome intermolecular forces. If these high energy molecules are at the surface of the liquid, they can escape into the gas phase. This is an endothermic process. We talked about with gases, how there's a range of energies, all right? Some of them are high energy and some of them are low energy. And liquids have this too. So you're gonna have some that automatically are like, I'm out of here. On the other hand, some of the liquids will always stay in the liquid part. They don't have enough energy. They're not interested in getting enough energy, you could argue, to go beyond it. Here's, show, here's a graph showing the amount of molecules that are able to escape the liquid. Now, let's say that this dashed line right here, that's the energy required for the liquid to become a gas. When they have this much energy, that's what's gonna happen. So here's a red curve for a hotter temperature. Here's a blue curve for a lower temperature. And you can see that as you increase the temperature, i.e. go from blue to red, you have a lot more molecules now able to escape the liquid and become a gas. They have enough energy. But even at the colder temperatures, you will have some molecules capable of forming a gas, of getting out of the liquid. And so that's what's really gonna be important to us. So even at the lower temperatures, there will be some molecules over the liquid, some vapor molecules. That being said, your liquids don't automatically just go away when they start to boil because not all of that hotter temperature water sample or liquid sample is gonna have enough energy to escape. You have a lot more able to escape at the hotter temperature, i.e. molecules to the right of the line, but all of this area over here still not doesn't have enough energy to escape. So boiling is a gradual process because of the distributions of energies, all right? And this happens for all compounds, all right? It doesn't matter the liquid or anything like that. As you increase the temperature, you certainly have more energy and you'll have more molecules able to escape. But there is always gonna be some that won't have enough energy. And at the colder temperature too, you will have some that will be able to break away. This is a flask with a lid on it, all right? It's a closed system in my world. 
And if you have a closed system with a liquid down here, all right, some of the liquid is gonna be able to get into the gas phase. Now, once the molecules go into the gas phase, some of them wanna go back to the liquid. This is the natural thing. It's like they get a lot of energy and then they go back to the liquid. But this is going on and off. So liquid, gas, liquid, gas, back and forth, back and forth. The interesting thing for us here is that these molecules that are over the liquid are gas molecules. And they call this a vapor pressure. So I'm gonna talk about a new term now here called vapor pressure. And vapor pressure is nothing more than the gas over the liquid, and it happens at anything, any temperature, blah, blah, blah. It's easiest to understand vapor pressure if you have a closed system. If you had an open system, what would happen is all the gas molecules would escape, more liquid would go to the gas, and eventually you wouldn't have any liquid left over. But in a closed system, we can talk about what's happening. Um, rate is a chemical term for speed. So it, what this is saying at the end is that if you have a closed system, eventually the speed of the molecules evaporating, going from liquid to gas, equals the speed of the molecules going from the lab gas to the liquid, which is condensation. That's the joy of a closed system Then you can talk about it. But what's really interesting for us is this gas over the liquid is what helps liquids to boil. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. In a closed container, molecules move back and forth between the liquid and gas phases. If the rates of crossover are equivalent, the overall amount of substance in each phase remains constant. The system is said to be in a state of dynamic equilibrium. Cool. So dynamic equilibrium just means that the speed of molecules evaporating equals the speed of molecules condensing in this context, all right? We'll talk more about rates and equilibrium as we go through, but all it means for us right now is all these liquids will have a little bit of gas over them, and the fancy name for the gas is vapor pressure. The liquid in the butane lighter is in dynamic equilibrium with the gaseous butane which has a vapor pressure of about 2.4 atmospheres. When the valve is opened, butane gas escapes from the lighter. The system goes out of equilibrium, and liquid butane rapidly evaporates into the gas phase. When the valve is closed, the system quickly comes to equilibrium again, with a pressure of the butane vapor equal to 2.4 atmospheres. Cigarette lighters are actually pretty clever, and they exhibit this equilibrium vapor pressure thing. Uh, initially, the cigarette lighter is a closed system, all right? And what happens is the butane, which is the liquid right there, uh, has a little bit of gas pressure over it, the vapor pressure. As you open it and you create a spark, then the butane that escapes uh, ignites, all right? All the alkanes like butane are great fuels. And so you've got your cigarette lighter for uh, showing off at rock concerts, whatever you do with cigarette lighters, I don't need to know. But anyway, after a while, then you stop using the cigarette lighter, closes up, vapor pressure reestablishes it, you're good to go. Now, maybe you've had a cigarette lighter that, oh, it's dead, but then you come back to it for a while, after a while, and it works again. That's because sometimes you need to build up the vapor pressure one little bit longer. And so the liquid down here is able to make a little bit more for like a final thing. It's also interesting to me that in a cigarette lighter, they supposedly have two plus atmospheres of pressure. 2.4 is what the video said. And that's kind of interesting. We have about one atmosphere of pressure around us all the time. But in these little tiny cigarette lighters, you've got 2.4 atmospheres. As heat is added to a beaker of water, the vapor pressure of the water increases, thereby increasing the rate of evaporation. If enough heat is added, the vapor pressure of the water equals the atmospheric pressure. At this point, large bubbles of vapor begin to form in the liquid, and the liquid boils. Pressure can be measured over liquids, and that's what they're doing in this graph. And you can see here how as the temperature increases, the vapor pressure, which is the y-axis, also increases. 
increases, increases, increases. Now, full on boiling of water doesn't occur until the vapor pressure, this blue line, equals the atmospheric pressure, the pressure around us all the time. And assuming you're roughly at the ocean, seaside-ish, or something like that, that's gonna be one atmosphere, or 760 millimeters of mercury. So when vapor pressure and the equilibrium atmospheric pressure are the same, that's when you're gonna see boiling. So boiling is a result of the vapor pressure uh, equaling or exceeding sometimes the atmospheric pressure around it, which is really cool. Um, vapor pressure does increase as the temperature goes up. Vapor pressure is pretty important when you're understanding liquids. So. Forget her, I can cook. There we go, mac and cheese. Boil water. What am I, a chemist? <laughs> bum, bum, bum. American dad could resist and stuff like that. Anyway, boiling water is a chemist. Yeah, well, now you know what boiling is. We'll talk about how you can uh, have uh, water boil at different temperatures coming up. However, I don't think that's what he was thinking about in this particular video. In the flask is water heated to about 55 degrees Celsius, well below water's normal boiling point. We use a device to evacuate the air from the flask. The water boils, though its temperature remains at around 55 degrees. You can actually make water boil at different temperatures. This is an example of where they put a pressure, a little bit of a vacuum on their flask of water. And by doing that, you're lowering the atmospheric pressure. Well, vapor pressure versus temperature is the same curve, but now we're lowering the atmospheric pressure down. And so you can begin to have water boil at lower temperatures, which is crazy. Um, we did this a lot in graduate school. We had some stuff that was uh, would break down at say 80 degrees Celsius, but we had to get the water off. So if you lower the pressure down, you can make your water boil 50 degrees-ish. Your compound won't dissolve, won't break down or anything like that, uh, and you can get rid of it. That being said, if you go to a place like Death Valley, which is lower in elevation, so below sea level, all right, or the Dead Sea is another example that's used a lot, your atmospheric pressure is higher than it is at seaside. And in those places, your water won't boil until you have a temperature greater than 100 degrees. So what it comes down to is this vapor pressure is a natural phenomena over liquids. And any liquid temperature, you will have a vapor pressure. And boiling occurs <clears throat> when that vapor pressure and your atmospheric pressure are the same. And since scientists can make the outside pressure go up and down, all right, down is usually more helpful than upper ones and stuff, uh, you can make water boil at different temperatures, which is cool. If you uh, make your mac cheese, like American Dad, <laughs> in like uh, Boulder, uh, Denver, Colorado, the Mile High City, well, mile high means the atmospheric pressure is lower. So it takes less energy to make your stuff boil. It takes longer to cook your mac cheese in places like uh, Denver, Colorado, uh, because you don't have the heat energy transfer to your mac cheese, which is kind of cool. And there's more. Heating the liquid water converts it to a gas, which pushes molecules of air out of the container. The inverted can traps the gaseous H2O when we place the can in cold water. The temperature change converts the gaseous water into liquid water, which occupies a much smaller volume. The can is crushed by the pressure of the atmosphere. Gases push against things all the time. Collisions with each other, collisions with the wall, stuff like that. Liquids are kind of constant. They don't have that same kind of pressure. So in this example, they put a little bit of water in an empty can and they heated it up. So all of the liquid water in the can had turned into a gas, all right? Then they inverted it and they put it in cold water. So that liquid water, liquid, that's that steam, then the vapor inside instantly went down to a liquid. Well, now there's nothing else pushing against the can. So your can was crushed, 
<laughs> it's kind of a dynamic uh, thing to show and stuff like that. But anyway, it's just tricks with this vapor pressure. You're turning all of the gas, which was pushing out against the atmospheric pressure, uh, you turned all of it then into a liquid like instantly by putting it in the cold water so it was crushed. This is the same phenomena when you're, uh, if you've ever seen movies of science fiction and they're in space and they go out without a spacesuit. <laughs> that's all right. Well, the bodies are, and you see the blood coming out. It can be really gory, I apologize. But anyway, that's the same kind of phenomena because our bodies are used to pushing against the atmospheric pressure, which is pushing down, and you put them in a vacuum like space. Bad news. Gee, you had a couple of <laughs> Oh, it's crazy and stuff, the things that can happen. This has major implications in industry. Now, these are uh, trailer current tank cars and stuff from a train. And here's what probably happened in these situations. Uh, you had some kind of uh, liquid in here, which was easy to get into a gas. And they quote unquote emptied it, all right, maybe with a big point pipe or something like that. But there was still a little bit inside, <clears throat> all right? Well, then if it was a hot day and they cooled it down, maybe by rinsing the outside, all the gas went down to a liquid, the, cat, the car was totally crushed. This is obviously a lot more serious than our little aluminum cans being <laughs> squished, but it's the same phenomena. And they have to be really careful if they're cleaning outside and stuff like that. So vapor pressure, this is all we're seeing, all right? And all liquids have a vapor pressure over them. You increase the temperature, your vapor pressure goes up. And when that vapor pressure and the atmospheric pressure are the same, that's when the boiling occurs. These pressures will push against the outside, the atmosphere pushing down and stuff, so you have to be careful. This is a graph. These are all vapor pressure graphs, all right? And we have a red, green, and a blue line. This is diethyl ether, this is ethanol, and this is water. So first of all, notice how the red diethyl ether is uh, the first graph we see. The green ethanol is in the middle and water is on the outside. Now, vapor pressure, all right, is about getting your liquid to go into the gas phase. And normally, if you were to think of random molecules, you'd think that, well, as molar mass goes up, it would take more energy to get those molecules into the gas phase. But why I like this example is that's the opposite of what we see here. The molar mass of diethyl ether uh, is quite a bit more. It's got four carbons and an oxygen. Uh, it's, it's pretty high in terms of the molar mass. Ethanol has only two carbons and an oxygen, so it's a smaller molar mass, and water is the smaller molar mass at all. So if you thought about just the molar mass, you'd have this reverse, right? Like water would be over here and diethyl ether would be over here. Why this is not reversed is because of those intermolecular forces. Now, first of all, for all three of these, as you increase the temperature, your vapor pressure goes up, and that's what you see everywhere, basically. But what, what's happening here? Diethyl ether is polar, all right? It's got an oxygen with two lone pairs on it. Uh, the ethyl groups are certainly not the same, so this would be polar, and it would have a dipole-dipole intermolecular force. Now, ethanol is also polar. This OH group is very, very polar. It has two lone pairs on it. So it would be at least dipole-dipole. However, supercharged dipole-dipole happens when you have nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine with hydrogen. And ethanol's got that. This is an OH bond. All the alcohols exhibit hydrogen bonding. So even though the molar mass is smaller, ethanol has a higher vapor pressure because of the stronger intermolecular forces. And then along comes water. Now water has by far the smallest molar mass of all. However, it's polar, tetrahedral slash bent, 109, all that jazz because of the two lone pairs. But more importantly, it's got hydrogen bonding and it actually has two sites of hydrogen bonding. Like you've got one there and one there. Ethanol has only one. So water has the highest of all three of these. Smallest molar mass, but still the highest vapor pressure, which is crazy. 
So we're definitely seeing the effects here of intermolecular forces on these molecules. What's cool about a curve like this is this is one atmosphere of pressure, which is what normally we exist at. So if you see where the vapor pressure curve goes through that line, that'll tell you what the boiling point is. So the boiling point for diethyl ether, we'll talk about what normal means here in a little bit, 34.6. And likewise, water is 100, stuff like that. Okay. So these curves are super helpful to scientists that might deal with these liquids. Uh, I want to just point out a couple of things. All of these vapor pressure goes up as the temperature goes up, and of course vapor pressure would go down as the temperature goes down. When the vapor pressure and the external pressure are the same, that's when the liquid will begin to boil. So if you look at the literature in chemistry, they'll talk about the normal boiling point because water doesn't always boil at 100, all right? There's different temperatures you can make it. So a normal boiling point means that you have water boiling and you're at one atmosphere. And why that's important, if you lowered your pressure to 400 millimeters per mercury, which is about half of an atmosphere, water would boil maybe 85 degrees Celsius, all right? You can really mess with the boiling points of these liquids if you can control the pressure. So a normal boiling point is just when the liquid boils at one atmosphere. And that's where scientists usually do things, but it will change if you change the altitude, it'll change if you pressurize or put a vacuum on your system, stuff like that. This normal boiling point is really important. Some compounds don't have a normal boiling point because they don't exist very well at one atmosphere of pressure. But the ones that we have talked about in this series certainly do. So the normal boiling point is just where the uh, vapor pressure goes into one atmosphere of pressure or 760 millimeters of mercury. All of these vapor pressures have uh, some kind of intermolecular force contribution. It's not just about molar mass, all right? And that's what we're seeing in this graph. The dipole-dipole force of diethyl ether is strong, but it's not as strong, excuse me, as the hydrogen bonds of ethanol. And it certainly isn't as strong as the hydrogen bonding in water. Water has like two sources, ethanol has just one. Oh, heaven forbid. But anyway, you can see here how the intermolecular forces are going up as you go this way. And that's what we see with the vapor curves, which is kind of cool. So here's a question where I'm asking you to compare three different compounds in the liquid state, all right? Or let's talk about their boiling points. Now, first one is methanol. All right, and methanol, you can probably imagine, is a type of alcohol. It's a smaller molar mass, but it has the OH, so it's going to be pretty strong. Then we've got methane, CH4, and we have hydrogen, H2. Now, we could draw a Lewis structure for methane, CH4. Does anybody remember what the EPG of methanol, or methane, excuse me, is? Tetra. Tetrahedral, right on. Carbon completely surrounded by hydrogens, tetrahedral, all right? And since carbon is completely surrounded by hydrogens, nonpolar, all right? Now, nonpolar compounds, their intermolecular force, we called it the induced dipole, induced dipole, the ID, ID. So CH4 has induced dipole, induced dipole working on it. Hydrogen also has induced dipole, induced dipole. It's literally hydrogen pulling on itself. Schwarzenegger with Schwarzenegger's twin, <laughs> all right? So that's also going to be nonpolar. So we'd say that if we're looking at decreasing boiling points, well, the strongest intermolecular force and the largest molar mass, both of them together, it's gotta be methanol, all right? So CH3OH has to be first. It'll be the biggest boiling point, and it's biggest for two reasons. It has the biggest molar mass of all of these, the most atoms, stuff like that, but it also has the strongest intermolecular force. So that'll be first, it'll be A or B. Now, to find out these two, 
they have the same force on them, same intermolecular force. They're both ID, ID. So if you get to an impasse like that, then you look at the molar mass of the compound. And the bigger molar mass should be a higher boiling point than the lower molar mass. So the very best answer here would be answer A. Methanol is the highest, the biggest boiling point because of its more molar mass and it has really good IUD bonding, strong intermolecular forces. These two are both the weak one, the ID, ID force. But CH4 should be higher than H2 because it has more mass. And mass getting it thrown into the air, uh, it takes more energy if you have more atoms than if you have more smaller mass. Any questions on that? Cool. Prof head off. You can always verify this kind of stuff with Google. <laughs> so you could put in methanol boiling point and <clears throat> that'll come a number, and then hydrogen boiling point, and methane boiling point, blah, blah, blah. However, of course, it's better if you can think about it. You don't have to waste your time. Google Profit back on. Questions? Scarcity of a liquid depends on the strength of its intermolecular forces. Glycerol has relatively strong intermolecular forces and is rather viscous. Its resistance to flow is high. Ethanol, by contrast, has weaker intermolecular forces. It flows easily and has low viscosity. If you're making uh sugar candy bars, uh, stuff like that with liquids, the viscosity might be something really important to you. Now viscosity is the ability of a liquid to flow. And as you can tell right there, they really compared glycerol to ethanol. Glycerol was just amazingly slow, all right? Like, like molasses kind of stuff, all right? On the other hand, ethanol flowed really fast. Now, we're not gonna talk a lot about viscosity, but one factor that's important for this discussion is that viscosity does depend on intermolecular forces. Now, ethanol and glycerol, which is a triol, all right, they both have OH bonds, which are really strong. But ethanol has just one, and glycerol has three. So they feel that glycerol sticks to other glycerol molecules a little bit more efficiently, and that's one of the reasons why it flows really slowly, all right? So the stronger the intermolecular forces, you would predict anyway, that they would have a bigger viscosity. They wouldn't flow as well because they're holding on to each other. There's more to viscosity than that, definitely, but I did want to throw that out here as another use of the IM forces. Another really fascinating thing about the liquids and their uh, forces is that the force uh, that's exhibited at the very edge of a liquid is actually important, and it gets a fancy name called surface tension. Now, if you have a strong intermolecular substance, i.e. water, which is what most of this whole year is about, water is very strong intermolecular forces. And the water molecules will like be pulled down a little bit by other water molecules. Now waters in the depth of the liquid will have 360 forces working on all directions, X, Y, Z axis, blah, blah, blah. But these are just like left, right, forward, backwards, and downs. There's nothing above. And it creates a little bit of a type of a force, an inward force of attraction. And you can make water and strong intermolecular forces do some really interesting things from these surface tension forces uh, that you would never be able to see in like gasoline or oil or something like that. A paper clip is placed carefully in water, or rather on it. The metal clip floats because it isn't heavy enough to break the water's surface tension. By adding a small amount of soap, we reduce the water's surface tension. The paper clip sinks.
this surface tension is the quality of the liquid that causes the surface layer of that liquid to behave like an elastic sheet. It's the effect that allows insects to walk in water and water drops to hold together. This cycle happens again and again until the droplet is small enough to be completely absorbed. Water is a great example of the surface tension. You need a pretty high intermolecular force to make this happen. And of course, water is one of the strongest ones. Now that first one, you can do that at home. You can actually place a paper clip on water. Don't use a super heavy paper clip. Be very gentle when you put the paper clip on the water, but it is possible. I've done it, it's amazing and stuff. However, the minute you add a little bit of soap or detergent or anything like that, it breaks that surface tension. The, water, the soap gets in, starts making other kinds of forces, and it breaks it and the thing will sink. Now, why that's important? Good old bugs like to coast on the water, all right? And they hang out and stuff there. Well, you know, there's an oil spill or a, oh, like what happened in Ohio, it's so sad. They start putting chemicals in the water just to get rid of them and burning them. Okay, prof hat on, we're not gonna, you're not gonna hear your instructor go off on that. But anyway, uh, it's too bad, man, because uh, all of that stuff, that junk, even the burnt stuff and junk, gets in the water and the poor insects are gonna sink. And if the insects sink, then the birds can't get them and the birds, you know, it's the whole food cycle, blah, blah, blah. It's, okay, not gonna, push my personal feelings of environmentalism on anybody, but you can probably see what I'm thinking. So anyway, just realize surface tension really important, all right? Uh, try and keep your things clean and stuff. Um, if you tap water, you sometimes if you, that was a really fast camera they were using, but anyway, the little droplets hold together, which is pretty cool, and that's another effect of surface tension they hold on, and you can see it was like bouncing. Anyway, let's get on to an example. It says here, which of these would you expect to have the strongest surface tension, okay? And a question like this, it really comes down once again to intermolecular forces. Now, all of these molecules are polar, all right? Sulfur and oxygen are in the same group, group six. So when you make a Lewis structure, and if you don't believe me, go ahead and draw them out, but all of those sulfurs and oxygens are gonna be tetrahedral slash bent. So they're all at least dipole, dipole. But one of these is more than dipole, dipole. Can you tell which one it is? When do you uh, when do you get the supercharged dipole dipole? Hydrogen bonding with what, NO and F. Well done. Hydrogen bonding with NO and F. So this one right here, you've got oxygen, all right, but the oxygen is not connected to hydrogen. This is an example of an ether, all right? Oxygen is connected to carbons. So this oxygen isn't connected to hydrogen, you wouldn't have it. Sulfur doesn't have hydrogen bonds either, so it, that one's not gonna be dipole. That'll be, those will be just dipole-dipole. This is another ether, diethyl ether. So again, it's got dipole-dipole, but not hydrogen bonding. But good old C, that's an alcohol. All the alcohols and carboxylic acids and amines for that matter, all of those will exhibit hydrogen bonding. And so we would expect from this list and this discussion for that to have the highest surface tension. So if you had a big pool of each of these, which I'm assuming you can make into a liquid, you would expect that this one would be most likely to float your paper clip. All right, it won't do it probably as well as water will because it's so strong with intermolecular forces, but that would be the best candidate for all of these. Questions? And yet there's more. The other day I uh, was reading a paper and anyway, I got coffee on it and the coffee started to kind of go up and stuff. And I was like, oh man, at first, but then I realized, woohoo, it's like our first lab in Chem 222. When we watch the liquids go up the piece of paper, the chromatography lab, well, capillary action is just a fancy name that happens when the liquid inside sometimes will gravitate up or down the side of your container depending on the forces interacting. So that's a lot of words. 
Here's two examples, and both of these we'll assume are glass containers. Now glass is basically silicon dioxide in a, in a polymer chain, and silicon dioxide is basically polar. So most glasses, this is zero level glass discussion, more or less polar, okay? If you put water into a normal glass container, water begins to go up the sides because the water is polar and the glass is usually polar. They like each other. They're gonna try and get in touch with each other, if you will. It makes a concave meniscus, all right? Concave up is like a cup. Concave down is like a frown. Anyway, neither here nor there. Concave means it makes like a small little cave in the thing. You'll actually see on the liquid that there's like a little bit of a gap. Now, we have a barometer in the analytical balance room in our lab with mercury inside. Now, mercury has metallic bonds, and metallic bonds and hydrogen bonds don't usually get along super well. So in this case, mercury, and also nonpolar solvents would do this too, tries to get away from your polar glass. Only like types of bonds will get along to each other. So that means what's called a convex part, all right? So you can actually see if the liquid inside is polar, or in this case metallic or nonpolar, uh, depending on what the thing looks like. So concave is what happens when you have similar kind of types of things together. We have some nonpolar glasses, uh, types of glass, and the nonpolar glasses would be concave with nonpolar stuff inside. But most normal glass is polar, more or less. On the other hand, you can have convex kind of things when the different parts are different ways. So if you ever see this, you'll see like sometimes there's a bulge with things and sometimes there's this little smile, <laughs> all right? It's like a cup. Anyway, the cave, the little smile is concave and that means that the forces are similar to each other. Now what we did in lab was really- A piece of paper is dipped in water. The water moves up the paper by capillary action. The attraction of the water to the surface of the solid paper allows the water to rise against the force of gravity. In the chromatography lab, we placed some metal dots there and we had a solvent that basically raised it up and the metals would go along with it. All right. Well, that works really well if your paper and the type of solvent are similar intermolecular forces and that's what we did in the lab. We have some paper, which is chromatography paper for more nonpolar substances. It's a little bit more expensive because most papers are actually polar. They're made of cellulose, which is, in a nutshell has polar oxygens all over it too. But anyway, this capillary action uh, is a natural result. And that's why when I was reading the paper, really that's what happened. This stuff just kind of coffee it was, just kind of went crazy. And then I had to read through the darker lines. 21st century problems. Questions on them? Now, chemistry is all about energy, just like physics and all the physical sciences. So we have enough information now that we can start making uh, diagrams to figure out how much energy it takes to convert, say, a solid to a liquid, or a gas to a liquid, or a gas to a solid, all these kind of things. And we'll go through some examples right here. Uh, we will not harm chocolate bunnies in the process, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, and anyway, I, I thought that was a fun video. Anyway, uh, back in Chem 221, all right, we talked about Q equals MC delta T. And that's one of the players we're gonna use in this next section to figure out the energy. But the goal of it is I might say, you know, how many joules does it take to convert 30 grams of blank solid into 30 grams of gas? And these are the kind of things that you can do now. Now, one thing that's really important is after a discussion of intermolecular forces, anytime you go from a solid to a liquid or a liquid to a gas, it's always gonna take energy. They're always endothermic because you're breaking those intermolecular forces. On the other hand, anytime you go gas to liquid, liquid to solid, or even gas to solid, you're actually gonna get energy back out because those gas molecules have a lot of energy in them and you're making stronger intermolecular forces so the excess energy is released. 
So at the very end of the day here, all of the values going solid to liquid, liquid to gas, solid to gas, whatever, all of those are going to be positive energies, endothermic joules, all right? But the opposite direction, gases to liquids, gases to solids, etc., those are all going to be exothermic and those will all be negative numbers. Now, when you're doing these kind of problems, MC delta T is great if you have the same phase of compound, but you're changing the temperature. So for example, if we took liquid water at zero degrees Celsius and heated it to liquid water at 100 degrees Celsius, we could use Q equals MC delta T. M is the mass, so more mass, more heat, more heat Q. Uh, C is the heat capacity of liquid water. What's the value of liquid water's heat capacity? Sorry, four. Four, yeah. 4.184. My man, that's right. 4.184 is a number we'll use a lot, so make sure you have that written down somewhere. And then delta T is final temperature minus initial temperature. So if we're going from 0 to 100, final minus initial would be 100 minus 0, 100. The other kind of transformation you'll need, though, is the energy to have a phase change, i.e. go from a liquid to a vapor or a, or a solid to a liquid or anything like that. Now in Chem 221, I said it was the heat of something, in quotes, times the mass of something, in quotes, and I'm still going to use that here. Heats of vaporization are the energies required to take a liquid and turn it into a gas. And these are the kind of numbers you'll have for a delta H VAP. And in my world, that's a heat of vaporization. But why we're talking about it here is that if you look at these three numbers, intermolecular forces, once again, will affect these values. Water has a high heat of vaporization, 40.7 kilojoules per mole, because it's again got all those hydrogen bonds. And xenon, which is induced dipole, induced dipole, the weakest, although a lot more molar mass, only 12.6 kilojoules per mole. So all of these heats of vaporization are also affected by intermolecular forces. You never have to know any of these numbers. I would absolutely give them to you, but you do have to know like how to use them. But maybe you don't want to go liquid to gas. Maybe you want to go solid to liquid. No problem. The official term there is called a heat of fusion, all right? And that's the energy required to melt a solid, turn a solid into a liquid. And all of these will have different values. They'll follow these kind of patterns. So heat of vaporization, heat of fusion, excuse me, for water is greater than the heat of fusion for xenon, all right? Um, what is important though, in all these kind of transformations, you're not changing the temperature, you're just changing the phase. So in Chem 221, we did like Q equals MC delta T to get it up to the boiling point. And then we had a mass of something times a heap of vaporization to turn the liquid into a gas. How do we find those values of heat of vaporization, Dr. Russell? Great question, random person in the back of the room. I have to introduce here what's called the Clausius-Clapeyron equation. And Clausius-Clapeyron has been kind of the workhorse of people trying to find heat of vaporization or sometimes the sublimations and stuff like that. Clausius and Clapeyron were two chemists, scientists, that figured this out, I guess, independently, and they published about the same time. But what they found is that if you take the natural log of the vapor pressure in millimeters mercury, and you plot it versus one over the Kelvin temperature, you actually get a straight line. Now in today, this week's lab, we're gonna talk about linear regression. And if you have nice linear data, like a line like this, you can plug it into this linear grade regression part and out will come the slope and out will come the y-intercept. The slope is the heat of vaporization. So if you do the clausius clapeyron equation right, the slope and the heat of vaporization are the same. Um, in this equation, you use a different kind of R. Uh, we're not gonna talk about clausius clapeyron too much in this class, but I wanna throw this in because it is a really imp uh, important equation. 
This is the energy R, it's the other kind of R that you might see in this class. He's a scientist, he walks around in days most of the time. This is probably why they were thinking about things like Clausius Clapeyron. Uh, only reason I'm bringing up Clausius Clapeyron is because it's how they find heats of vaporization, heats of sublimation. They don't just pull out of thin air. It's a little weird. How they figured it out is amazing, but uh, it's not something that we will do a lot of. But we will talk about linear regression in lab this week. Questions on these? Okay. On Friday, we'll do an example of how to pull all this stuff together. I'll show you an example for ice. Uh, but for this, this is it. I will see you later. Have a great day.